Thank you for joining us in this dialogue uh, session focusing on the building and real estate development industries. We have assembled a panel of outstanding interlocutors who are leaders in their respective fields. They are all based in Miami-Dade County and therefore very familiar with the region and its particular climate resilience challenges. I will introduce them in a moment. One of the consequences of the COVID-19 crisis is that the media and national attention has shifted away from sea level rise in Miami. Well, not entirely because as you know, Miami continues to grab the headlines uh, in COVID-19 related uh, news as we saw recently. But we did have a break from the barrage of alarming stories on Miami facing serious challenges from climate change impacts and related stressors. Well, I'm not sure if this is good or bad. Yes, we had other things to worry about in the urgent response to the pandemic, but also with regard to violence leading to a national discussion on racial equity which also, by the way, fed back into the resilience discussion, underscoring the social dimensions of climate change, for instance, in bringing attention to the ramification of climate gentrification. So the short reprieve in the collective consciousness from the impeding climate induced problems may have been momentary welcome, given the circumstances. You want to put the camera through? I, if you just yeah. open Zoom, I can give you an ID Plus, as a right? participant ID. But, but, but it is also worrisome because being in Miami, we need to keep the spotlight on climate change and resilience. The problems are still here or coming was the latest data confirming the predicted trends. So the symposium, thankfully, plunges us back in full and acute awareness of the problems and needed solutions. It also shows us how, while the media had shifted focus, the researchers, practitioners, government officials, and resiliency officers were busy at work, advancing along new innovative pathways towards resilience positioning Miami as a leader in a worldwide effort. You heard this from Jim Murley this morning. And this includes our esteemed panelists whose job is to be very much aware if not entirely focused on such matters. We heard a great deal uh, today about the big picture but strategies mounted by government, municipalities, and universities. What I would like to get from this panel is a more close-up anchored view. I'd like to zoom in on individual leaders and their companies and how they are negotiating such challenges and opportunities. And these are, in alphabetical order, Karen Bolter, who is an urban and coastal coastal resiliency expert for Arcadis US. She specializes in GIS analysis of people, cities, and the environment to inform data-driven climate resilience. She has presented her models and research via TED Talks uh, and T uh, TV stations, including NBC, PBS, National Geographic, the History Channel, and the Weather Channel. Kieran Bowers heads the US operations of Swire, the Hong Kong based conglomerate, including overseeing Swire's most ambitious project to date, Brickell City Center, the 4.9 million square foot mixed use project, which completed its first phase of construction in 2016. Mr. Bowers now oversees the second phase of this project, which is anticipated to include Miami's tallest skyscraper, by the way. Bernardo Ford Brescia is a founding principal of Architectonica, Miami's iconic practice, with US offices in Miami, New York, 
Los Angeles and international offices in the Middle East, Southeast Asia, and South America. Bernardo has designed award-winning projects in 59 countries around the world, including, by the way, Swire's Brickle City Center, just mentioned above. His many roles as a leader in the community include chairing the University of Miami School of Architecture Dean's Advisory Board. Jacqueline Gonzalez Tuze is the founding principal of Tuze Studio. She serves on the MRED's advisory board. MRED is the Masters in Real Estate Development program at the School of Architecture. She, she serves on the MRED's board and chairs its a resiliency committee. She actually initiated this committee in her tireless advocacy for resilient development. She has designed uh, award-winning projects in Asia, Europe, and the USA that include high-profile hospitality and mixed-use projects. David Martin is the CEO of Miami-based development firm Terra. He has cultivated a portfolio of more than 5 million square feet of residential and commercial real estate valued in excess of 8 billion. Under Mr. Martin's leadership, Tevra has achieved international acclaim for its commitment to design excellence, resiliency measures, and sustainable development, as well as for assembling remarkable multidisciplinary teams, including global figures such as Rem Koolhaas OMA, Renzo Piano, and BRK Ingalls, to name just a few. Now, I'd like to turn to each one of our panelists to hear about how the themes addressed in this conference affect your own practice and your decisions, the decisions you make in your projects every day. How do you position yourself and your team in relation to strategies formulate, formulated for the region or resiliency issues that affect you in particular? It'd be great to if you could share some uh, uh, examples actually to illustrate your personal relation to these very important issues. So let's start with uh, Karen. Oh, Karen is not, is, is Karen in the, has not been admitted to the stage? Okay, no problem. Let's go to uh, uh, Jacqueline. Um, hi, everyone. My personal relationship with resiliency is um, number one. As a as a Miamian, I'm kind of tired of being the punching bag of, for the story. I, I I see a lot of coastal cities. I see a lot of. Um, I read the news like everyone else, and you know, as a longtime resident. Um, a Cuban American, and our family's been here in this region for many centuries. You know, this is an area that means a lot to me from a personal and professional standpoint. Um, my children would like to come back to Miami. We've, they've grown up here, they were born here. And I am, uh, I'm very vested in this community. Um, I got involved with resiliency or got involved with sustainability because of my son who had childhood asthma. I got involved with the Green Committee and became lead 12 years ago. And I've taken every opportunity that I can to educate myself um, to be a better professional and to perfect the craft of building uh, for this region. And um, I recently, a couple of years ago, joined MRED with the intention really of only speaking to that group of people, which I believe in the power of private development um, as, a, as a part of the solution. Um, and I thought that they had been left out of the conversation quite a bit. And every symposium that I ever went to for two years, it was mostly comprised of policymakers and public officials, but very few developers with the exception of David and a few others that I could I can mention were at the table. And I think that, that that's, that's a problem because most of the building that's getting done in Miami, uh, most of my career uh, has been private sector and I see the power of it. I'm someone who grew up in Panama next to the Panama Canal. So I'm a big believer in the, infrastructure, the power of infrastructure and the power of can do. And we're way overdue as a country for infrastructure. And I think we're at a sort of pivotal moment where we either build what we need to build 
for the next generation that follows so that there's a viable future for us in this region. And I do believe that people will want to live here and there's many reasons to want to live here. And it's really our responsibility, I think, um, as, as professionals, as citizens um, to, to do what we can do. And my hat is I'm an architect and I'm a builder. So I'm, I'm anxious to get beyond the, the studies and the analysis paralysis and get into the solutions business and get into what do we do and how, do, how should we build? And that's my, my focus and my interest um, in this topic. Great, thank you. So uh, Karen, you may, as you may have uh, uh, deduced here, what we're trying to do is personalize a bit those issues, like trying to anchor them in real experience and from a perspective, personal perspective, but also from the point of view of your organization. So can we hear from you about how the, the topics of the symposium actually are filtered through your eyes? Sure, can you guys hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. Um, I, my work, so I'm a planner, I'm a com communicator, and I'm also an analyst uh, working with GIS and data. So my, my work fits into those three buckets, stakeholder engagement, flood risk modeling, and supporting local governments in the development of FEMA applications, which fund infrastructure resilience. So a goal in all my projects is communicating the different risks from climate change that have, we've talked about today in a really effective way, um, increasing awareness in a way that causes a change in behavior towards taking action, being safe and prepared. And so uh, my, my work in South Florida, I've, uh, I've worked a lot on a lot of different plans and vulnerability assessments. And I always felt frustrated that it didn't go anywhere. Like it stopped at a certain point and there, so there was this information action gap. And to bridge it, um, we've talked a lot today about the different barriers. How, why, or why do we have all this information and not enough is happening? And so of course, one of the barriers is um, money, right? Getting the money to pay for it. And that's why I find so much fulfillment in the, the FEMA applications that I do to fund infrastructure resilience. Um, and with new funding coming out and the new Infrastructure Act, there's going to be a lot more money to, to fund all of this. So it's a wonderful opportunity. And so it's, it's great to keep everything really positive and focus on, on opportunities. Um, and just going a little back further uh, in terms of my, my research, um, I, I really I think communicating, there's a lot of things right now, another barrier is that there are certain communication methods that we have that are, are not working with climate change. I think I, I, I'm reading a lot of information and seeing different um, methods of sharing the data and messaging and um, telling the story. And I, I think we things have been getting better, but a lot of the, like today, everything was extremely specific case studies that relate to where we live in our neighborhood. Um, but it, we've, we've come very far because we used to see, you know, these like conceptual, you know, here, here's the carbon emissions, here's the, you know, just very um, cookie cutter type mm -hmm. messaging. And so making it more specific, I think is really working and specific to South Florida because of our unique features, um, like the groundwater and, uh, and also our unique population. So I, I have more to say, but I'll let others uh, introduce themselves, but really the, the, the crux of, of my intention is being data-driven and equity-driven and also provi providing a business case, being cost-effective with what we're doing. Oh, you're muted. Uh, I'm sure we'll have an opportunity to come back to some of these points, but let's hear now from uh, Bernardo. Bernardo, you are muted. I'm muted. Hi. Um, I'm here with other people, so that's why I'm wearing this thing. Um, uh, hi. Um, I'm just an architect who practices in just about everything that is the built environment. Uh, my office does planning, and public buildings, private buildings. And if I had to address this question of the consciousness about resilience, um, 
generally in the public sector, I do have to say there is a very much um, awareness of the importance in the public buildings um, that they be resilient. There's no doubt that many municipalities around the country are very aware of the long-term effects of what is designed and built in their cities. However, I've got to say that the private sector is a little bit more divided, is not as universal in terms of the awareness and the willingness to invest in resiliency. Because I do think there are, we can't categorize all of the private sector as um, not interested, but there is some of the private sector is very short-term thinker. You know, they are, they see projects only in the lifespan of their investment, but not beyond. And they're not looking at what's going to happen in a hundred years um, or whenever they may be. The, the, so I just logged back on. Oops. Did I lose everybody? Yeah, well, no, yeah. you're, you're fine. Okay. And um, it is, um, so there's uh, some, I think there is a percentage of the private sector that uh, is uninterested, so to speak. Uh, they only see uh, what's coming on the project when it's gonna be sold or when, or if it's gonna be during their lifetime. And there's, um, and that is really difficult to bridge, but I cannot categorize, as I said, because there are uh, more and more a growing number of, of private sector uh, clients that are aware, are interested, and want to be part of that resilient thinking. Um, sometimes that happens because they're forced by the city, but sometimes the laws of the city are not yet in place, and therefore mm -hmm. it's got to be done voluntarily. I mean, some of our clients that where we have implemented those policies have done it because they believe in it and not because it's a requirement. I have to say Brickell City Center could have been an air conditioned mall, you know, instead of being open air, it could have been, it didn't have to harness the forces of nature to cool the place. I mean, it didn't have to do that. That was a voluntary move. And that's nothing in the code that would restrict somebody one way or the other. And, uh, um, and there are, many clients that uh, voluntarily actually raise their buildings to um, to higher levels that are taking into account what may be the future. But in the codes, there's a range between today and the future. There's still some leeway. There's not like 100% required. So it means it has to be that somebody's willing to do it. And uh, um, I do have to say that the consciousness is more in cities that are that, are, that have experienced some kind of catastrophic event, like Miami or New Orleans, or some of the coastal city or Savannah or coastal cities that have actually had a hurricane. And it's sort of, the hurricane gave them a lesson of what civil level rights could be, you know? It is, and those who have not experienced it um, are more skeptical or don't see the sense of urgency. So to that extent, as, uh, I heard some of the speakers mention it, uh, Jackie. Uh, we are um, we are very easy prey by those who try to criticize the future of the city because we've had the actual photos of the real experience because of a hurricane, not because of sea level rise, and yet, uh, and therefore we are happily blamed. You know, I've been told that this city has no future, but the reality is that. Probably there are cities, I mean, there are cities all over the world that have the same situations. It just didn't have a hurricane to prove it, you know? And it's, um, it's, uh, it's really, uh, um, I, I, some say it's a pity, but no, actually it's a blessing because mm -hmm. the fact that those events occur, not to diminish the sadness that comes with them, but it is, they have helped us be more aware mm -hmm. and, uh, and help developers and governments be more aware because, because the event was proof. And uh, uh, so to that extent that Dean mentioned how the school has an opportunity to be a leader and it does because of the reasons that I've explained about the perception of Miami. And therefore we are the sort of the right place for this, to, this kind of thing to, to be, to raise consciousness among students, among the world. Um, uh, it is uh, it's an opportunity that we shouldn't miss that could help so many others beyond Miami. 
Um, I think that's uh, as much as I can say from my experience in my practice. I can tell you in other countries in the world that I work, if we talk about some of these issues, it's very difficult for them to grasp what we're talking about because of the lack of an event that's proven. You know, it's a really, really difficult and there are so many low-lying coastlines in the world. We're not the only ones. I mean, it's ridiculous that we would be, we'd be targeted, right? In reality, there's, a, I think we're a little speck in the statistical uh, world of, uh, of low-lying lands. But as Karen mentioned, there are particular conditions here having to do with the geology, I guess, which makes mm -hmm. it a very challenging problem here. We'll come back to this. Yes. Karen has things to say about this, but can we hear from uh, David? Thank you so much, uh, Rudy and U University, and uh, I'm honored to be with such a, a great group of speakers. Um, I think that um, you know, I, I run a company. Uh, well, I have to wait. Uh, Tara. And, um, let's go for the auto real quick. There we go. Uh, I run a company, uh, uh, Terra, that um, is is truly a full service integrated real estate firm, uh, 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 development and management of all asset classes and kind of really primarily South Florida. And, and so I'm, I'm pretty passionate about um, kind of the future growth and prosperity of, of our region and, you know, how, you know, we can make investments in resilience and, and do it in a, and figure out the business case for it. Um, you know, I think that, uh, that we have to look at, uh, and, and we're starting to, we're seeing a lot of uh, uh, cities and municipalities. One of the biggest issues in South Florida is we have so many cities. Uh, our firm's probably working in around 18 different municipalities that have their own gover governance and, and sometimes uh, conflicting codes and, and how all that can get coordinated so we can have a unified kind of a, a, a attack and, and, and really have good intel and information and data like was mentioned earlier about, uh, you know, with all the new LIDAR technology of really what, you know, all the hydrology maps of what's happening with the water and and how we could just prevent it from uh, from creating disruptions on business, or, or uh, you know, you know, how do we look at ways to decentralize our power so that uh, you know small businesses or homes don't lose power uh, for such long periods of time? So, you know, I, I'm really passionate about what the solutions are. I think there's an immense amount of uh, 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 great minds and leaders and 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 universities that are working and, and thinking about this and as top of mind and, and I'm happy to be part of a lot of those exercises, but it's, it's very multidisciplinary. It's very difficult. Uh, this is not just like creating a toll road. I mean, these are substantial investments that take decades to kind of realize their, their returns. And, and so, you know, I'm really interested in how cities and municipalities can help utilize their zoning codes uh, and utilize other ways to to create uh, you know, value capture, right? Provide development rights for smart, responsible development in the right places and, and, also, um, and also create a, a, a value proposition for regional improvements and in infrastructure. We, we developed a lot of parks and green space. Uh, we're doing a special one in Miami Beach right now um, that uh, has an amazing underground um, uh, uh, water quality and, and, and storm drainage uh, uh, cisterns that is pretty significant and really going to help the region. So, you know, I'm really interested in how to, you know, hack capitalism to kind of solve some of, of these needs as well as obviously um, help with the grants and everything else. But it's, it's, diff it's very difficult to finance uh, climate resilience, and but it's something that I'm really passionate about and looking for solutions on. So thanks. Oh, great. We want to hear later a bit more about the, this, I, this difficulty of financing climate resilience. But meanwhile, can we hear from Kieran that about the, this why, let's say, let's put it this way, this wire perspective on this. Hi, Rudy, thanks. Sorry, I 
sort of struggle to get online early and thanks very much for the invitation to uh, to speak this afternoon um yeah i mean the, the swipe perspective is that you know it relates really to our stated aim back in 2017 which is to be the um leader in sustainable um development in the industry by 2030. So we have a very clear um, pathway set out to uh, be leading all those metrics um, on how we interact with um, our partners, how we interact on a economic level, um, a performance, you know, operational performance level um, and a sustainable level um, on our impact on the environment, all of which is now being measured and gets published in our annual system sustainability report um, and by 2030 we intend to uh, to be um, leading the, um, the whether it's through the various indices stock indices or in any context of sustainable conversation about real estate um, and there's a lot of work to go um, but we do operate in countries that you know are going to be um, very much subject to the effects of climate change um, both China Shanghai Guangzhou Hong Kong and obviously here in Miami. Um, I think part of you know the the beauty of that stated aim is that it recognizes that real estate development in and of itself is one of the leading contributors to the carbonization of the world. Um, whether it's the way that we you know use water for the concrete that we use to you know to um, to construct buildings, or even our you know the more obvious HVAC mechanisms, you know the materials we consume. Um, you know, there's, there's clearly a recognition now, I think, that um, there's a lot more that real estate developers and operators can do um, to minimize that. And, you know, we, we would like to progress to some, you know, much more lofty aim of net, net carbon, but um, I think it's going to take us a little while to get there. Um, you know, I think when, you, when you're sort of working in an environment that's got very clear, defined um, goals to reach, um, it kind of then, you know, has an impact on you personally as well, that you become much more conscious about, you know, your own um, habits and, uh, and how that sort of impacts, you know, uh, sustainability in its broadest sense, right? I mean, I don't think it's just the, the green angle of it. Um, it's also, you know, social equity, um, which, which you mentioned. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's, it becomes part of your innate thinking um, and it's very hard to get away from nowadays. You know, I, the other day I made the mistake of leaving the tap on when I was brushing my teeth and I don't think my children have let me hear the end of it. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it's, um, it's unforgivable. Um, and you know, we, both on a family level, we're also trying to, you know, to do our bit and buy less and, and be much more conscientious about what we do with stuff that we're no longer using. Um, right. So I think you can either go from the very elevated, um, big big stuff that we do from a development point of view but it's very easy to translate that much more into a into personal basis as well um and you know the journey i think is just beginning as you see you know brands of retail brands really getting to grips with the fact that the new generation of consumer um wants a much more concerted effort from companies to look at what they do and and you know the the waste that they produce um and fashion is obviously really coming to grips with that which you know intersects obviously with Brickell City Centre and, and the shopping side, and trying to work with those brands and see what we can do as well. Um, at the moment, it's just it's a little fragmented, but there's definitely a lot of money and a lot of thinking going in the right direction, um, and I think we'll see the uh, the benefits of that in the coming two to three years, where we go from thought stage to to, to more action oriented stage. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Now, before I move to the next question, I want to remind our audience that they are welcome to type some questions in the Q&A box and we'll try to get to them before the end of the session. Now, uh, what I, I would like to talk also about the opportunities. We tend to focus so much on the, the challenges. Well, surely there are also opportunities to talk about. For instance, when I'm recruiting students for the School of Architecture, I always tell them that Miami is the new Rome now. You know, Rome has traditionally been the destination for architecture students because it has so many lessons to offer. But now all the schools around the world are bringing researchers and students to Miami. I'm sure you guys have met with some of these delegations. 
because they think this is, of course, this is a ground zero. It's a living laboratory. So it's exciting and tragic at the same time. But I want to dwell on the exciting. Is there a business case to be made? Uh, Karen, you mentioned affordability, but also can you think of, given the investment in infrastructure, can you think of potential engines for economic growth due to the, the, the whole mobilization for resilience? So Karen and everybody else, please yeah. uh, uh, chime in. Uh, I'm sure you all have ideas about this. Yeah, I can start. I mean, I think that the business case is so powerful. And actually, there's um, there's studies that show that every dollar that you invest in pre-disaster mitigation, you're saving $6 that you would have spent if you were reacting after some kind of disaster event. So it's really shifting from being reactive. It's, you know, just kind of okay, there was a disaster, let's clean up. It's so much more cost effective to be preventative and being preventative. I think the, the opportunity is like really looking at those co-benefits, like the environmental co-benefits and the health benefits and just quality of life being increased from these, these projects. Um, you know, one thing that, that, that I found this a great opportunity, it's been a passion of mine is with flood risk to buildings, you know, the telling the story and like looking at tools to understand your flood risk, there's a lot of tools out there, right? NOAA has the sea level rise viewer, there's climate central tools, there's the first street. So all of these tools, you go in, you type an address or an area and you can see the risk. But like, like David was mentioning LIDAR, the LIDAR is just the ground elevation. Well, we know that buildings are higher. There's either steps or there's some kind of foundation. And so this is a huge data gap. The only, we call it the first floor elevation. And the only um, way to get it right now is through elevation certificates, which is just really old fashioned. So one of the projects that I've really enjoyed and I'm working with um, University of Miami on is to use really innovative methods to measure that first floor ele elevation. We're finding ways to do it like in the cloud with either with drones, remote sensing and using that data to do machine learning um, so we're looking to, to provide these data sets and it's so important because for that business case, for that cost effectiveness, there's a difference where the water gets in your yard versus the water actually getting into through the front door, right? And causing damage and insurance claims. So that's a huge gap that's missing. And I think there's a huge opportunity um, to do that. And actually we did one of the, I've, I've, developed 17 FEMA applications. All of them were awarded except for one, which was that first floor elevation study. So my company, Arcadis, had a pro bono competition and we, and we were awarded the, the job. So that's, that's a great opportunity. Um, just one other thing that, that I did want to mention, I know earlier Monica from the Office of Resilience was talking about um, the sea level rise strategy. So we, we worked on that with them. And what the opportunities I love there it was a very positive report, just looking at different possibilities, like pathways of how Miami could adapt. And um, two of the, there were, there were various um, options. And the one that was most popular with the public was the green infrastructure, kind of like what, um, what Isaac was talking about and, and doing like linear parks and, and, and different stormwater green infrastructure um, on a property. So I think that there's, it's clear that that's what's popular right now, what the, what people want. And, and you can mix that. You can have a seawall that's hybrid with mangroves and vegetation on it. So um, just, to, just to touch on a few, the, the sea level rise strategy, um, we're also working with the University of Miami on that um, map, map housing tool that, that Jen and Robin presented on. So just so many great things. I'm working on some health projects um, a hurricane hub and all of these positive are getting information out there and getting people to engage. I wanted to add one more <laughs> item. Uh, this is Bernardo. Yes, I think yes. aside from the facts, there's also the need to keep, to have the public informed because uh, I do have a specific case on a project that we were proposing a, the, the proper elevation for resiliency 
and we had uh, uh, just about a revolt from the neighbors who didn't want a building in their neighborhood that was raised. And they were not aware, and like we tried to explain that there's no consciousness necessarily, and there's no government program to be um, educating people about the importance of uh, resilience. I think we all in our small world of architects, developers, planners, scientists are all aware of this, but of the, of the issue. And I know there's some about it, but there's also and a lot of people who are uninformed or uninterested on the subject. And I was, we were really shocked in our office. We would thought, we would have thought that the neighborhood would be welcoming a building that was resilient and was respecting the principles uh, that are, uh, that come with uh, resilient thinking. And instead, um, we got a reaction, it, it feels too high. It doesn't relate to our home or neighborhood. And I think that uh, the, the, uh, keeping people educated, making people know, educating people about this is equally important. That we can't stay in our small world. We mm -hmm. need to take it out to the to the general population. I don't know if others have experienced that kind of reaction, but we did, and we were frankly really surprised. Yes, I wonder if that's due to the, the kind of the disjunction between the preparation we are doing now with infrastructural investments or maybe building strategies. Uh, uh, and the fact that we are preparing for something that is perhaps not tangible or not already here. So does that, is that this junction maybe, maybe the source of this issue that you're talking about? Has anybody experienced this? Uh, yeah, I mean, Bernardo's right he, on that, that education is key because it's gonna take huge investment. And so not, not only from an implementation standpoint, but from getting people behind what the level of you know, investment is gonna be. I, I think that the city of Miami Beach did a, a pretty, you know, decent job when they started the raise the roads, but there was a, a pushback from the neighborhood and, and they were one of the first cities that I saw that started to do that. Um, people need to understand the why. And they also on the innovation side need to understand the co-benefits of jobs and, and quality of life and what, what, what they can hope to see out of it. Because long-term, it, it, sometimes it's very abstract. I went to a couple of the early meetings Arcadis did with um, the CROs at the neighborhoods and I saw the how people tr really struggled to understand, you know, where they were in the map and how it was going to impact them, and, and that is an ongoing conversation that needs to continue so that people feel like it's not something being imposed on them, but it's something that's being done for them. If you look at Key West, there's a group of homeowners that really desperately want them to raise the road, and the city is evaluating. No, I'm sorry, there's only nine roads, nine houses on that road. It's not worth the investment. So that's the flip side of that. That if they if they don't raise the road and they don't put in the in infrastructure, there is no future for your particular piece of property. So people need to be educated about it so they understand that it, it is actually a wonderful thing if you have a city that is thinking ahead and and, and laying in that infrastructure. But it isn't always wonderful if it's not rolled out properly and people are, are feel like they're victimized as, as a result of how it's done. I think it's important to, to listen and to and to make sure you include the community in, in the planning. And I think that's been going on. Uh, the Resilience 305 has been that, that whole process, but it needs to continue. It's, it's just in the baby steps right now, I think. But maybe then when Karen talks about, for instance, how greenways or seawalls doubling with other functions, so they're not purely engineering proposition, but they bring amenities. I think that may also help. So yep. they, they serve multiple purposes. Um, now, um, maybe I'm still fixated on <laughs> the COVID, but I'll go, I, I'm going to go back to this because I think it's a great case study, a lesson where we saw how the crisis precipitates uh, uh, innovation. I mean, so much amazing stuff has been done in with the biochemistry in the production of the new vaccines, etc. And so quickly. So my question is, uh, do you anticipate this kind of innovative drive uh, from the uh, climate change uh, impacts, especially when they start to intensify 
do you see a potential for innovation and how our industries may be transformed by those innovative uh, uh, solutions? I definitely do. I think that um, I'm excited about the, the transformation of construction and the new materials and the new methods of building and the new systems that we need to put in place that the, even if you look at with all the technologies that exist right now, we don't, we don't meet the goals that we need to meet from a carbon standpoint. So there has to be, I'm a futurist because there's no alternative to, you know, we've already altered nature so much that the only way out of, of having an outcome that is going to be a good one is for us to innovate through it. And I think, for example, in concrete, in our region, we're a concrete town. Um, there's a tremendous amount of, of work to be done to uh, reimagine how to build with concrete. Um, and I think it's it's also about re-educating our, our professionals. Um, and it's not just the kids in school, but the the engineers, you know, frankly, how to engine how to engineer with this new concrete, how to use less concrete, how to be more efficient, less wasteful. I, I was talking to a structural engineer, for example, how can we make carbon less, you know, concrete less carbon intensive? And there are studies just like we optimize for glazing, you do wind tunnel tests and you optimize the structure. That's just not, he said, that's just not a question that I get asked. How do I make the, the, the foundations less carbon intensive? I, that's not a conversation we're having. That if you add some curing time, you could reduce the carbon uh, by half. And maybe, you know, what is the cost of that? And if you put that in front of a developer, then maybe, you know, they would pay an extra 5% or maybe they would make up the savings because we do some prefab or we do some modular. I mean, there are so many things out there, 3D printing, that I think we're at the cusp of a huge change in the way we build. And, and that is very exciting. And it is the way forward because if concrete were a country, it would be the third biggest emitter after China and the US. So it, it, I think the one area for, for major innovation that, that I, I think University of Miami, our region could lead on is, is, is construction for coastal regions. And, and then this material that is our, our forte, this is how we build and how most of the world builds. Um, I think there's a definitely a leadership position to be taken. And the other thing is that the world is gonna look increasingly like us, hotter, more humid. We've been dealing with it for decades. My kids that go to college in the Northeast, they don't even have air conditioning. And they're like, what are we doing? You know, we've been dealing with this issue and the world is gonna look a lot more like Miami as it heats up. So there's a lot of knowledge that we can share both on how to build and how to, how to live with water and heat. Um, and I think that's exciting. And may I ask also the developers to speculate about uh, potential innovation in the financial instruments and in insurance, et cetera. You know, Specific to insurance, uh, something that's important to note is that uh, the state of Florida actually is a, a uh, profitable uh, 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 premiums to number of claims uh, state for the National Flood Insurance Program. Uh, we, uh, our buildings along our coastlines uh, get treated uh, for flood insurance purposes, get treated uh, the same as a uh, single family home uh, in, 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 other, in other parts. Uh, and that single family pretty much has more uh, claim for the flood policy. What's, what we've been dealing with, and I think, and you all know is, is we, every day I grew up in, in South Florida, I lived with natural disasters. We, we probably developed the strongest building code and, and maybe the country. And, and because of the, uh, you know, in our, our community is very, uh, you know, resilient in, in psychology and personality and, and just culturally. And, and, and so what's, what's unique about, I think, um, you know, what we're doing here is um, the innovation is going to be, a lot of it is going to have to do with construction materials and, and sustainability and, and, and how do we use renewables for power and, and those types of uh, uh, smart uh, uh, ideas, you know, uh, and smart design, but but we're also going to be innovating in how to create our city. I mean, two thirds of our county, uh, at least in Miami Dade, is is the Everglades National Park. Our, our you know our our environmental groups and and uh, uh, you know have, are protecting our, our 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 and conserving. So we have this history of conservation. Uh, we have this history of being resilient. We're really building within, uh, 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 you know, you know mangroves and and um, and vegetation and and how this city was created um, so 
you know, for, for us, I think the innovation that I see happening today is, is resiliency and, and thinking of just smart design, uh, smart decision making on investments and, and infrastructure investments. I mean, it's becoming the culture of our, of our municipalities and our departments. And, and so that's really exciting that, 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 that we're seeing a level of coordination and, and adoption uh, by our uh, by our administration and our electeds that that I think is uh, going to be very useful to us as we look to to solve things as it relates to technology innovations and and, and product innovations I think one of the biggest things we have to think about is you know how do we collect data on the performance of a lot of these infrastructure improvements a lot of times uh, you know engineers and planners are modeling uh, certain performance matrix or performance requirements. Uh, you know, how do we really develop a smart kind of, you know, smart plan to be able to really have an ease of, of getting data to see what, whether the return on investment was worth it, right? Uh, did it really uh, uh, mitigate the flood? Did it really, uh, you know, that, that type of decision, I think a lot of times we're, you know, putting in, we're doing projects like Miracle Mile, we're doing projects in Geraldo and creating these ports, you know, uh, streets and resilient streets and kind of looking at that as a pilot pro program, right? But but the question becomes, how do we collect data in order to understand that the investment was sixfold uh, the return, the investment uh, was worth it, right? It, it improved the business climate and reduced insurance for that area. It uh, it created some beautification and, and enhancement to outdoor seating. I mean, so those, those, that type, and, and it really is, I think, one of the most resilient streets in the country uh, from a water standpoint. So, so for, I, I think the innovation is gonna be coming. I, I see it in the planners and the architecture and the, the way we're building our buildings and, and where we wanna build and uh, you know, building you know, along our transit nodes and, and, uh, and getting people out of cars and, 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 uh, and making our neighborhoods more connected. So, so I think there's a, a holistic kind of innovation happening from a planning point of view. And I think the more the planning discussion and vision can, can, can be parlayed and communicated to the community, uh, in addition to the engineering side and technical side, I think the more adoption we're gonna get from the community to want these types of investments there. Uh, but I, I do think it's, um, you know, our community is, will have some challenge in, uh, given the transit nature of, of certain neighborhoods uh, uh, that we have and, 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 and hopefully more and more people wanna, wanna have a sense of uh, pride in our city and, and wanna see it long-term in the future and really feel that South Florida is an important city, important for the United States, important, important for the state of Florida. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and so I think our, our, our communities um, you know, I think a lot of times don't want change and, and that's something that we need to uh, think about how we can uh, communicate all these different ideas in an organized way in a methodical way to provide a timeline and a roadmap of, uh, you know, how we develop these neighborhood strategies that we need to, to uh, just to, you know, uh, solve our, you know, our challenges, just like other municipalities and, and other neighborhoods need to solve their challenges. So I think the innovation is, is a little, it's going to, I mean, there's innovation all around. I'm just, just seeing uh, governments and, and administrations really embracing uh, how to make their, our community more resilient. And I think it's, uh, that's, that's something, uh, a nuance that we, that we need to adhere to because at the end of the day, the public sector, along with the private sector, need to work together uh, to, to really help solve some of these issues. Yeah, just if I, if I may, Rudy, I'll just chime in that, um, you know, look, eventually, ultimately, the capital markets are going to drive quite a bit of behavior. Um, you know, they will ultimately only allocate capital to projects that, meet certain um, you know, levels of sustainability criteria, whatever they may be. Um, and you know, capital markets, you can already see where you know, companies like Blackstone, for example, are really swinging capital allocation to companies that have very clear uh, sustainable programs. 
um, because that lowers risk in the long term, right? It's, I mean, it's, a, it's, not, a, it's not a purely altruistic um, methodology. It's actually because there are risk, risk adjusted returns um, greater for those asset classes or those particular assets um, versus assets, you know, that, that haven't necessarily taken those, uh, those criteria into account. So you can see capital markets are really driving in that direction because there, there are greater returns over the long term to be realized from them. I think for insurance, you know, in my humble point of view and at the risk of causing great offense, it remains a pretty blunt instrument. Um, you know, first of all, there's the great mismatch between an annual recurring, you know, negotiation of what insurance rate you may have versus an asset you've built for 20, 30 years, um, you know, with mitigation factors in. Um, I think the innovation there is um, there's huge opportunity, um, much like you've seen in sort of even things like auto insurance, right, where you only pay for the hours that you actually use the car. Um, one would never have thought of that probably four or five years ago, but lots of people are moving into that space. I think for property development and, and, and property coverage, um, I mean, again, it, it's, it, as I say, it's pretty blunt, right? It's about, are you in the flood zone? Yes or no. Do you, you know, have these, you know, sort of, I would say little points or, or checklist um, areas, but none of them are particularly embracing of, of where I think, you know, the um, development innovation is going or materialities or, you know, some of the other risk mitigation factors that developers are considering now. Um, so insurance, I think, has a uh, huge, um, huge room to, to grow with the industry and with the business and therein drive, I think, you know, development to, uh, to be more um, pushing the envelope on, on what it can do in areas that, that are prone to sea level rise or, you know, violent um, uh, uh, weather events. Yeah, that's, these are great insights, and this is exactly what I was uh, really anticipating you saying, you know, this kind of uh, this uh, sense of uh, really radical, perhaps disruption with uh, innovative uh, ways to finance projects, to uh, uh, insure projects, etc. I think we're going to see more of this. Um, now, uh, oh, we don't have much time. I want to, uh, I have one more question uh, for you. I wanted to speculate on this, uh, this uh, uh, proposition. Those of you who have attended the other sessions may have sensed uh, a shift in the university culture, in the research culture, uh, a shift towards more engagement with stakeholders, a desire to partner with industry and government. And this is very, this is happening all over the country, but is especially strong at UM, where we are trying to actually create new structures that enable this kind of uh, uh, collaboration. So I'm, I'm inviting you to think of the university as basically as an extension of your R&D department for potential collaboration, and then ask you about what kinds of projects then you would want to pursue with this research arm of your own operation. Um, so just, I, I'm suspecting that you may have some, uh, a wish list that you would like to share. I, Karen already actually uh, indicated that there is a potential project here for us to collaborate on. So this is for all of you to... I I think that we need um, to move into the implementation phase and that's what building 305 is stipulating. So I would love to see prototypes, Dean. I would love to see the students engaged in this, in, in building examples to answer David's question, how much do things cost? And what is the return on investment? Does it actually work? Can we measure the performance? Because we keep, we, we are talking a lot and then, but it's time I think to go to, to scale. And I'm a big believer in prototypes and every innovative company that I've ever worked with, whether it's Nike or Apple, or when we did Cyberport Bernardo in, in Hong Kong, you know, we would build it and we would test it and we would measure it. And I think that's a really good place for the university to give an honest assessment of, does it work? And, you know, and I think that's how students would learn really, frankly, to engage with the industry and to really be um, in the solutions business. I think 
we we absolutely need to start building in a smarter, better way. And I think getting real data and real measurement performance um, from from this, I think, would be really valuable. So that, that would be my my wish list. Let's just talk about that. Yes, I, <laughs> I, it's exciting. I think for you know, I I. <laughs> My favorite part of my job is working with academia. It's where I come from and I love it, especially my, my projects with, with UM, like the affordable housing tool. And, and I actually have interns through my health project, MIT interns, and it's really a joy to mentor them. And um, something that I learned actually from uh, Ben Kurtman at Rasmus, we worked on a project and it was called co-production of knowledge where researchers are creating in academia or wherever we're creating data and we don't, we're, we're so we're the producers of this data and then the, the practitioners, whether they're in the government or the industry, they're using the data, but is it usable? So the co-production of knowledge is before you even start your research, you reach out to the people that are gonna use the results and you say, is this useful to you? Is it in the right format? Is it in the right, you know, is this gonna help you with your needs? And we've been doing that with the affordable housing tool as well, like reaching out to the community and saying, what do you need? And how can we adjust our research to make sure that it fits your needs? So um, the first floor elevation project is a great one because we are working with the local governments. But I think that just whatever project you do, make sure that from the beginning, you're involving anyone that's going to be potentially using the data and getting their feedback. So uh, many things to think about. And Karen, I will be in touch because uh, we, I think we have a lot to offer here in terms of the projects that you are interested in. There's a, a big possible, a great potential here, especially I mentioned that the university is very keen on creating a whole new structure, an academic unit actually, that, which is dedicated to this kind of uh, uh, work and partnership. So more on this later. And now I'm reminded by Roberto that actually I have to close this session because we want you all to attend uh, the concluding uh, uh, plenary event, uh, which also features the Dean of the Graduate School and the President of the University. So I thank you all for joining us here and hope to continue the discussion and see if we can do something together in the future. And, and Dean, yes. um, I, wanna, I wanna commend the University and the yes. School of Architecture for taking leadership in this subject. Amazing. Something that we need, we need leadership from an institution and, and universities are the best leaders because they have the they're a place of information. And that is uh, great that you're taking this initiative. It, make, it speaks very well of the school. Thank you. And yeah, great panel. Thank you so much.